Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes for Clark College's Network Technology Department, and this is our CCNA 2 class in Tech 222, Routing and Switching Essentials. Today we're looking at Chapter 7, Access Control Lists. There are three sections we'll cover with Access Control Lists today. We'll look at the operation of ACLs, we'll look at some standard IPv4 ACLs, and then troubleshoot them. What we won't be covering are IPv6 ACLs or extended ACLs. We'll leave those for another lecture. ACL operation. By default, a router does not have ACLs configured. Therefore, by default, a router does not filter traffic, meaning any packet arriving on an interface is forwarded. A router opens the packet, reads the header information and looks up in its routing table the destination IP and forwards it out the egress interface. So it does exactly what you learned in Cisco 1 that a router does. What we're going to do now is change the functionality of a router by adding a filter list, essentially a list of permit and deny statements specifying to the router certain packets are allowed and other packets are not. So packet filtering, uh, which we call an ACL, is a list of statements called an ACE, which uh, is processed sequentially. That means top to bottom. And so, for instance, if you permitted something in one statement and then deny it later in another, it'll never get denied because it reads the list top to bottom and it stops reading the list as soon as a match is made. So a packet would come in the interface and the router would go down the list top to bottom until a match is made. So if a permit statement precedes a deny statement, the permit statement would uh, per perhaps match that packet, meaning the packet is allowed on through the interface. Similarly, if you had a deny statement before a permit statement, the, the opposite would happen. The packet would be denied and discarded and it would never be permitted even though there was a permit statement later on. So it's important because of the sequential nature of these filter lists that we give them some thought. We have to kind of work through the list and make sure that we have some good logic behind our statements. We also have to be cognizant of where we're going to place the list. So let's say we're looking at a packet coming into the router and then being uh, routed and forwarded out an interface, we have uh, different choices on where we can place the list. We could place it uh, filtering incoming traffic coming into an interface, or we could place it filtering outgoing traffic going out of an interface. Different situations or scenarios um, will guide you to where it's most appropriate to place it. Generally, inbound ACLs are more efficient because they filter the traffic before it is routed. An outbound ACL is filtering traffic after it's already been routed. So that means that the router would have already received the frame, torn the frame open, read the packet header, routed the packet header, and delivered it to the outbound interface, and then it's denied. So a lot of extra processing CPU and RAM is utilized that's essentially wasted now because that packet was destined to be discarded. So generally, as a general rule of thumb, it is always preferred to use an inbound ACL when, when appropriate. All right, let's talk about the wildcard mask. This is a powerful part of an access statement. So an access statement is a filter and we get to choose which of the bits are compared against the incoming IP address. So if we're looking at, and, and this could be the source or the destination IP address, depending on whether you're looking as standard or an extended ACL. So we can filter based on a wildcard mask. And whenever we have zeros in the wildcard mask, the corresponding bits will be compared in the IP address of the incoming packet. Wherever we have ones in the wildcard mask, we will ignore those bits in the incoming packet. Let's take a look. So 
So what we have here is an IP address coming in. Okay. That address is going to be compared with this wildcard mask. And you can see we have all zeros in the first 16 bits. That means we're going to look at every one of the first 16 bits of this incoming address. We're going to ignore the remaining 16 bits because we have all ones there. You can see that written out here. This says ignore these. They don't matter. They don't have to match. So what this means is the wildcard mask has said anything with a 192168 matches. It doesn't matter what you have in the last 16 bits. It's saying, unlike what's shown here, it's not saying they have to be zeros. They can be zeros or ones. It's irrelevant. It's going to ignore whatever's there. That means that 192.168.10.1, 192.168.255.254, anything that has the first 16 bits, 192.168 will match the statement. So that's the power of a wildcard mask. You could put all zeros there. If you had 32 zeros in the wildcard mask, it would have to exactly be 192.168.10.0 then. It would say only that single IP address is going to match the statement. But as written here, anything, again, that begins with 192.168 will match. So the wildcard mask is a powerful tool in deciding how broad you want your filters. So we can use the mask to filter entire networks and subnetworks. So we can look at either an individual IP address, just one, or we can look at a group of them controlled with the mass statement. So here's some examples. In example one, you can see what I talked about. If we want to match every single bit, we put all zeros in the wildcard. And that says that we are looking for exactly 192.168.11. So any incoming IP address must be that to match that statement. In example two, we're putting all ones in the wildcard, which means anything matches. Every single IP address, any one you want to make up, will match example two. I know you said, but, but the, the address is 192.168.1.1. This is where it can be a little challenging for students is we're then telling it with the wildcard mask to ignore all of these bits. We're saying none of the bits have to match. So you can have ones or zeros in any of the bits. So the result is anything matches that. So that's an any. And we have we actually have some keywords that we can you know that we can put in here um, instead of instead of this that we'll we'll learn. All right, in the third example, we can see that we are matching a subnet. So we're looking for the network or subnetwork 192.168.1. So the last octet, the fourth octet over there, could be a one or a two or a 250 or a 255, it doesn't matter. Anything will match. It's going to um, ignore the last octet. So that's essentially the wildcard mask. This is just explaining that range that I pointed out to you. So we create with the mask a range of addresses. Now this is an odd one in example two here. This is something uh, fun, yet perhaps in, impractical. So this is matching all odd numbered subnets, right? Because it's, um, it is looking at that uh, 24th bit there. The 24th bit is, um, is being matched. And so it has to be a one, which means that Anything with a zero in that bit position, so that's every other subnet, uh, will match this. So you can have some fun with this. Calculating wildcard mass can be challenging. So one shortcut is to um, simply invert the subnet mask. So if you have a subnet mask, take the opposite of it. If your subnet mask was 255.255.255.0, .255 .255 
then all you would need to do is put 0.0.0.255, as you see in example one. They're showing a mathematical way, but I'm telling you just take the subnet mask and invert it. So just find the subnet mask. which they're showing here in this second line. Those are all subnet masks. And notice the result on the bottom, that's your wildcard mask. That's what you're trying to make. So you just invert it. The hard ones are, are ones like this, where you have, say, a 252. Inverted, then, if you replace all the ones with zeros and all the zeros with ones, um, this is what they're basically saying is that 252 plus 3 equals 255. Again, I wouldn't do this with subtraction the way they're showing here. You can do it with addition. So you can say, okay, what plus 252 equals 255? That would be 3. And so that's what goes in your wild card. So you could read this. What plus 255 equals 255? Nothing. So 0. What plus 255 equals 255? 0 what plus 255, and you can just go along and, and do that, and I think you'll find that uh, useful. Right, and then these are these uh, key word abbreviations we can use in two situations. When we want to match all the bits, we want only to match a specific IP address and just one, we can use the keyword host instead of putting the 0.0.0.0, .0 as a wildcard mask. So we can replace those zeros with the word host. So that's called a keyword, and we use that keyword. Um, it, it means the same thing. So we can either use the wildcard of all zeros, or we could just use the keyword host. In the other example, where we want to ignore all the bits, so anything matches, we can use the keyword any. So instead of using the 255.255.255.255 in the wildcard mask, we can simply use the keyword any. So you'll see those commonly used as host and any. You're responsible for being able to do it both ways and recognize it both ways. So if someone chooses to use the all zeros or the all 255s in their wildcard, say on an exam, you have to be able to recognize what that's doing. But it is preferred generally to use the keywords when available. This is an example of those keywords in action. So you can see in example one, the two ways you could do that. You've got access list permit 0.0.0255.255.255.255 basically says permit anything. Now let's look at that 0000, 000, 000 that's in that statement. That actually could be any IP address. It doesn't matter what you put there. Uh, we typically put the first, uh, the first address that would match and that would be all zeros because that's the first address that would match, but every single IP address, every IPv4 address you could make up always matches, and it's because of that wildcard that ignores all the bits in the match. So we just put the 0.0.0.0, .0 there, but you could put 192.168.3.3. It doesn't matter what you put there because it will ignore all the bits anyways. Or you could simply write the statement as access list one permit any. Notice we're using the keyword to replace all of that, and I think it's a lot more readable. So we prefer it when you use the keyword. Let's look at the second example. Again, here we're going to match all the bits, so it does matter what, uh, what address we put there. That needs to be the address we're looking for. In this case, we're permitting 192.168.10.10. That's the only IP address being permitted by this statement, by this ACE. And you can see that in the wildcard 0.0.0.0. It's saying match all 32 bits, or all 32 bits must match. So another way to write that is to use the host keyword. And so in the alternative uh, version of that same statement, we can write access list one permit host 192.168.10.10. Again, I think it's just a little more readable. The host and the any keywords are optional, you can see that you can still do it the other way. They're just an alternative way to say the same thing. 
Let's talk about these general guidelines for applying an access list. So now that you've written an access list, you've written some permit and deny statements, it's time to decide where you'll place the list. So you've typed the list in your router and you wanna put the list on an interface, maybe FA01 or S000. You have to decide which interface you wanna place it and in which direction. Do you want to place it filtering traffic coming in the interface that would be coming into the router or filtering traffic going out of the interface that's traffic exiting the router or leaving. You can only have one ACL per protocol per direction per interface. Let's talk about what that means. That simply means you can't put two IPv4 access lists on the same interface in the same direction. So say for instance the interface was FA00, I could only apply one IPv4 access list to that interface in the in direction. I could have an, another ACL or the same one applied in the out direction. So I could have it applied in the in and the out. Or I could, in the in direction, I could have an IPv4 ACL and an IPv6 ACL both on the same interface in the same direction. You can see the rules there at the bottom. So only one protocol per direction per interface. Pretty simple. Best practices for ACLs. Well, the best practice, number one, is have a goal. You need to have some outcomes that you want to achieve. So you should be able to write those down. You have to be able to paraphrase what the goal of the access list is. What are you trying to stop? What are you trying to permit? What's the, you know, what's the goal here? What are we trying to limit? Or what are we trying to filter? And that goal is probably based on a policy of your organization. Right? So, for instance, if I had a, a VLAN that was uh, running web servers, and I had a couple web servers in this VLAN, and that's all I have in the VLAN is uh, two or three web servers, I might want to limit who can get to them. Maybe one web server is only for internal use, so I could write an access list that limits the IP ranges that are allowed to reach that web server. You should prepare a description of what you want your ACLs to do. Okay. That's just that paraphrasing, writing out those, uh, those goals or objectives. What each, uh, act, and an ACL, not the statement, not what each statement does, what the list does. And you may need more than one list, right? Because we may need to filter at different points on the network. The filtering um, to protect the web servers is probably going to go over by the web servers. And then I'll probably need a, a different filter list to protect my company from the internet, which uh, we typically call the firewall. So ACLs are firewalls and uh, we can write those statements. Another best practice is to use the text editor. So you just open a text editor, um, you know, like Notepad in, in Windows or, um, or any of the uh, ones, Notepad++ or any of the text editors you may like using. And those are useful because it makes it easy to type your commands and then retype them and rearrange them and kind of look them over and think that it's kind of a, a working canvas. It, you could type them directly in the router, but the problem is that they're kind of a hassle to move around. You have to delete them out and then re-add them. It, it, it's really cumbersome to um, reorganize an access list. It can be done, but it's much easier to just do it ahead of time in a text editor because it is very common to type the statements and then realize that you really need one above another or another down. Like I talked about, as you start thinking about it, you realize, oh, well, we're blocking that up here. I can't allow it here. I need to move this or I need to re uh, reword or redo um, uh, a statement so that the scope of it is um, fitting with the other statements. So the list kind of evolves and it needs a little bit of, of, of work. So a text editor is a good idea. You also want to try to test your ACLs. So what we generally do is apply it. It's helpful if you don't have to apply it on the production equipment. You could mock it up. Maybe you have an extra router or two that you could stick the access list on and you could run some traffic against it and verify that it is performing the way you had thought. Often we'll find that uh, an access list that had a logic error and that it is not actually filtering the traffic the way you had intended it to. 
So it's always best to test those because it's very embarrassing and uh, they say here costly, but it's more the embarrassment of putting an access list on a production uh, router and having all the network traffic come to a stop or have uh, things permitted that shouldn't be permitted um, and so forth. So that's a, that's a costly error. I guess I'll just share one, one quick one. A company that I consulted with um, applied it in the wrong direction. So it was the right list doing the right thing, but it was filtering traffic traveling the wrong direction. They had it on the right interface, but they'd gotten confused about that in and out, and they had applied it to the um, in or the out, I forget, but they applied it in the wrong direction. So it was filtering or looking for traffic that never came because it was coming the other direction. So it was applied backwards. So that can be uh, you know, a costly and embarrassing error. It was eventually caught because people said, gee, this, I thought this wasn't allowed to go through. We just saw this type of traffic on our network and I thought you were blocking that. And they said, yeah, we are. We Look, the list is right here and it's applied. And so with some testing and validation, we were able to prove that the list was not actually working. And then the question was, why isn't it working? And, and as you delve in, you find that. But much better to do that testing upfront ahead of time than on the back end after you already have a live network problem. So that brings us to where to place your ACLs. Well, if you were writing an extended ACL, an extended ACL is able to look at the source and the destination. And we always want to place those as close to the source as possible. The reason is it's more efficient. Just like inbound ACLs are more efficient than outbound ACLs, if we can filter the traffic early, if it's denied, we can save having that traffic routed through three routers and be denied all the way over at the destination. Why have that packet drive across our network just to be discarded at the end? We'd rather discard that traffic early, saving the bandwidth and CPU and RAM of our devices. So extended ACLs allow us to place as close to the source as possible. Standard ACLs, what we're focused on here, unfortunately don't consider the destination IP. They only look at source IPs. And so because they only permit or deny a source, they have to be placed as close to the destination as possible. That's because if you denied that source over by the source, it wouldn't be able to reach other destinations. So you have to actually usually apply a standard ACL on an outbound interface as far away from the source as possible, basically in the least efficient place on the network, where extended ACLs can be applied on inbound interfaces as close to the source. So extended ACLs are superior to standard ACLs. Of course, um, rules on efficiency, we talked about those. We also have uh, that third bullet point is talking about real world uh, considerations. Like you may not have control of all of the routers from A to B. So even though it's very efficient to put it on a certain router, you might not have the ability to do that. So you put it as close as you can or as close as is practical um, within the, for instance, sometimes I have the uh, option of putting an ACL closer, but I'd have to have three different ACLs on three different interfaces or I could have one ACL on an interface a little further away and I choose to put it a little further away so it's easier for me to maintain one access list than to have three. The chances with three, if I have to make a change to one, I have to remember to change the other list as well and they might become out of sync which might cause some security vulnerabilities. Um, so the human error factor says, you know what, even though it's more efficient to have three lists in three different locations, I'm going to go further out on the network where it's less efficient to place it. And that sometimes is what we call the edge router or the router connected to the internet. That's a classic place where I'll put an access list is traffic leaving the organization. So kind of, um, kind of that last point of control, right? Before the traffic is headed out the door to the internet, I may want to filter that traffic to block certain types of traffic. So we're looking at standard ACL placement. So with a standard ACL, if we're blocking traffic from 192.168.10.0, you see that on the left side of the diagram, that's PC1 essentially, and we're blocking that from reaching 192.168.30.0, which is over um, PC3 essentially, okay? 
And notice if we were to block that with a standard ACL, all we can do is say um, to deny 192.168.10.0. We can't specify um, the destination. So the command is simply to block or deny 192.168.10.0. So if we put that over at site A, well, PC1 wouldn't be able to get to PC2 or to PC4. So if we put it at router 2, it's the same problem. Even at router 3, we have to put it all the way down on the egress of G00. Because that's the only place where it still allows PC1 to reach PC4. So we're forced, because of the limitations of standard ACL only considering the source, um, and not the destination, we have to put it as close to the destination as possible, as you can see in this example. All right, let's talk more in depth about standard IPv4 ACLs. There are two types, numbered and named. Essentially, do you want to give your access list a number, like access list 10, or do you want to give it a name, like access list firewall? Well, let's start with numbered lists. So with a numbered list, you can use the numbers 1 through 99 for your list. So that's the um, ACL standard list. And you simply type your statements, access list, and then the number, and then the statement, permit or deny or optionally remark. Remarks are ignored by the router, but they're helpful to use. You can provide up to a 255 character remark. And if that isn't enough, you can add more remark statements. So you could do access list 10, remark something, and access list 10, remark something else. And so I often, at the top of my list, will start it out with three or four or five remark statements, uh, really detailing, one, who made the list and when. So I'll say that this list was created by admin Dwight Hughes on such and such a date and for this purpose, whatever purpose I have. Um, also, it'll have maybe instructions, like I like to point out if the list is permanent or temporary. Sometimes I add ACL lists for temporary reasons, and they should be removed at a certain date. So then I'd want to uh, denote that in the remark, like I added this access list uh, while we were testing a new server, and it should be removed when this condition is met or when this date is passed. And that's important to really do good documentation. The remark statement allows us to do that. You can also pepper remark statements throughout your list, especially if it's a long list, to explain what certain statements are doing. Like, why are you permitting something or why are you denying it? And then you can get rid of the list in one command. No access list 10 dumps the whole list, all the statements. You want to be careful when you get rid of a list like that, because if you've applied it to an interface, all traffic on the interface will stop. So you want to also make sure you unapply it uh, from the interface, which they're not showing here. But it's important when you've made a list and applied it to an interface. In this case, they just made the list. They haven't gone into an interface and applied it. You can see there's no command. They haven't gone into interface FA00 or interface uh, 0, 0, 0, 0. they haven't gone into an interface and applied this list, so we don't have to worry about that. So they can safely type no access list 10. But if it was applied to a interface, we would remove the list so there'd be no list. And at the end of every list is an applied um, deny any. And so what would happen is the list is still applied, but the list is essentially empty because you've removed all the statements. So everything would be denied, every packet. All right, so uh, you just from global configuration mode type access list and the number and then permit deny or remark and then the source IP address, the wildcard and hit enter, that's it. So that source IP address again could be in this case, it's a uh, network or subnetwork ID, right? So it's a, not a host IP, it's a network ID. And you can see from the wildcard that we are capturing uh, or permitting, in this case, the statement is permitting anything from the 192.168.10 network. So you could be .1.2.250.255. Anything will, anything will go because we're ignoring those last eight bits. You can see that in the um, mask. Now, this is the important part. Now that we've made our list, we're going to apply it to an interface. So we now have to go to a 
interface um, mode. So we type interface, in this case, serial 000, and then this is how you apply it. IP access group, this is kind of weird because you type access list to make the list, and you type access group to apply it. So IP access group, and then the number of your list. So if your list was 10, you would put a 10 under the IP access group, and then you choose a direction, in or out, or your choices. So in this case, we're filtering traffic, leaving the serial 00 interface. That's the reason for out. If we wanted to filter traffic coming in the serial 00 interface, we'd use the out parameter in. You could use the same list in both directions if you wanted. Uh, that's unlikely because it's filtering a source and the source is only going to be in one direction or the other. So you're going to have your list um, direction based on where that source is. So if the source is on one side of the serial interface or the other would depict uh, the direction you choose. So this is, this is a look at that all put together for you. So here they have with the topology diagram you can see we are trying to permit the 10 network, which would be essentially PC1 down there. And we're applying this list on the out direction of 0000. So it is being allowed out. It's also uh, presuming there's no other access list. Uh, it of course is allowed everywhere in this case, because we have really um, nothing to deny. But what about PC2? So PC2, tries to go out the serial 000 interface. Now PC2 can get to PC1 because there's no list between G00 and G01, so those interfaces can communicate no problem. But when PC2 tries to go out the serial 000 interface, its IP address of 192.168.11.10 is compared. Does it match that permit statement? No, because it's in a different network. Notice that we are matching the first 24 bits, 192.168.10. And it is 192.168.11, so 11 is not 10. It does not match that permit statement. So there's no other statement in the list, and so it is implicitly denied. Remember I mentioned on the last slide, if you get to the end of a list and it hasn't been permitted or denied, it is denied. So if a match is not made in the list, the traffic is denied. So if we didn't want that to happen, we'd have to put like access list one permit any. Um, at the end of our list to prevent. So you do this if you have a bunch of deny statements. Imagine an access list where you deny this, you deny that, and you deny something and deny something else, and you don't have a single permit statement in the list. Well, essentially, nothing's permitted. Even though you've only denied three or four things, everything is denied at the end of the list if a match isn't made. So you'd want to, at the end of your list, add a permit any um, to say, if it's not one of the things I've denied, it's allowed. Here's a look at denying a particular host within a network and then allowing the network. So this is kind of a similar kind of, kind of thing. We go into our list. In this case, they started with no access list one. That was just to erase the list they made on the previous slide. That's really not necessary if you don't have an access list one. So they removed access list one uh, because if they didn't do that, then these statements would actually get added, appended to the end of access list one. And we didn't want that. So they're starting out with deny host. They're denying PC1, but they're allowing everything else in PC1 subnet. So everything else in the 192.168.10 subnet is allowed, but PC1's not. Okay. And then they apply that to the interface. And so what that means is PC1 can now not get out. How about PC2? No, PC2 can't get out either because PC2 doesn't match either of those statements. See that? Just like on the last slide, PC2 is in a separate network, 192.168.11. And these two statements will refer to the 10 network. And so it doesn't match the first, it doesn't match the second, meaning it gets to the end of the list and is denied. So in this case, PC1 and PC2 are denied out the serial 000 interface. I bring this up because oftentimes this is what happens. We call this unintentional consequences. We apply an access list and we're only thinking about PC1. And because we're only thinking about PC1, we forget about PC2 because we're, we're not writing statements concerning PC2. So we don't understand that our list is going to impact other devices on the network that we're not thinking about. So we really have to think about 
of the network as a whole and really look at the topology, this requires an understanding of where you're going to place the list. So we have to now think about all the traffic that will be passing through that list, not just the traffic we're trying to deny or permit, but other traffic as well. We could place it over here. Now it's going to work a lot better, isn't it? So just by moving the list to a different interface, instead of going out the S00, we move it to the ingress of G00. Now look at that, PC2 doesn't get filtered. When PC2 goes in and out, no problem. In fact, PC2 can get to PC1. PC1 cannot get to PC2 or anywhere. So that's a little different impact. In the, in the previous slide, PC1 and PC2 could reach each other. Now they can't. So now PC1 really can't go anywhere. PC1 is trapped in its subnet. It can talk to switch one, but it can't leave the G00 interface. So that again may be an unintended consequence. If you were just trying to block PC1 from going out the serial interface, you've now blocked it from reaching PC2. And even though PC2 can reach PC1, say you could send a ping from PC2 to PC1, for instance, that would work because it's not going to get filtered in that direction going out the G00 interface, but the reply back will get denied. So PC2 will never know it reached PC1 because PC1 is not allowed to send traffic back. So if we block half of a transit, we pretty much have blocked the whole thing. Let's move on to named ACLs. A named ACL does the same thing as a numbered ACL, but like the remark statement, it's nice to give your access list a name. These names cannot start with a number and they cannot have spaces, so you have to use like dashes or underscores. And it's a rule of thumb, meaning not required, but it's a best practice to type your ACL names all in caps. So try to type them all in, in capital letters. And let's take a look at it. So here we go with the same kind of idea. We type IP access list, and this time we have to tell it it's a standard list. Notice we didn't have to do that with numbered ACLs because the numbers one through 99 are reserved for standard ACL. So we just type IP access list one. In this case, we type IP access list standard to differentiate that we want a standard list and not an extended list. So we say this is a standard ACL and then we give it a name. In this case, no access. And notice they're not using a space. So they're using an underscore. They're using all caps, which is not required, but it helps the list really kind of jump out when you're doing a show run. When you're looking at your config, it's, it's easy to see that all caps because everything in Cisco IOS is in lowercase. It really helps those lists stand out is the reason we do that. Then they are denying a host, in this case PC2, and then permitting everything else. And I had talked about this earlier. If you didn't do that, if you had a list just with deny host, the end of the list denies everything. So essentially the list denies everything, which is not what we wanted. So we're adding the permit any to allow everything else. And then we're applying that um, to the G00 interface. Now, there's, you know, a little, little bit of a, um, you know, understanding of what this list does. This list permits PC2 in this case from getting to PC1 because of the way the list is positioned. Again, PC1 could get to PC2, but would never know it because PC2 can't send a reply back because traffic going out the G00 is being blocked if it's coming from PC2. PC2 can get out the serial interface just fine though. So if we had the internet or something else out the serial 000 interface, PC2 can go in and out that interface. And of course, PC1 can go anywhere it wants. So in this case, we've basically blocked traffic from PC2 to the um, 192.168.10 subnet. So it can't get to switch one or PC one. If we just change the placement, as you saw in the previous example, you can use the same list and just flip the placement around and do something different with it. So if you put this on the out of the S000, it would stop uh, PC two from getting out to the internet, but then PC one and two could talk. Or if you put it on the in of the G01, so if you put it on the ingress of G01, PC2 wouldn't be able to get anywhere. 
PC2 wouldn't be able to get to PC1 or out the S000. And so you can have three different effects of your list, the same list, can do different things depending on where the list is placed. So placement of the list is just as important as the list itself. And you really have to know where you're placing the list when you're writing a list. You have to do those two things hand in hand. So you don't write a list and place it. That's how we operationally do it in the commands. You can see that here. But we really have to have in mind uh, where the list will be placed at the time we write the list. So we, we need to kind of keep that in mind. And you can use a text editor, and this is the example of using a text editor and then cutting and pasting the statements in. And so here the statements have been typed out in the text editor, and then they've cut and pasted them into the router. Works fine. You could also just type them into the router directly, like shown here, and then they're given sequence numbers. So if you type show access list one, you notice didn't type in the sequence numbers up in the configuration steps. They are automatically assigned and they're always 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. And you can use those sequence numbers to remove individual lines or add extra ones. Say I wanted to add between that deny and permit another statement. I could, um, I could use a 15 or a 12. I could use some number between there. To, uh, to add that. So I would go in like they've shown here, IP access list standard one. So they go into the, um, into the list and you could, in this case, they're typing no 10, which deletes out line 10. Instead of deleting the whole list and having to put the whole list back in, I can just delete line 10 and then I can start my new statement with a 10, which replaces it. Or if I wanted to leave 10 and 20 and insert one between, I, I could just type 15, you know, and whatever I wanted to type. So it's pretty useful to be able to edit your list and insert ACE statements where you want them and take them out where you want them. But notice it's more cumbersome than just doing it in a text editor. So sometimes in the text editor, you would just type no access list one, dump the whole list, and then just cut and paste the whole list back in with your changes. And so you just kind of maintain the list in a text editor where it's easy to move the statements around and, uh, and kind of cut and paste that back in, in in a dump kind of fashion. This is that inserting that I talked about. So in this case, they're, they're just adding a statement between 10 and 20. And you can do this with um, numbered or named ACLs. So uh, numbered or named ACLs doesn't matter. Again, named ACLs are a little nicer than numbered ACLs just because the name, like no access, uh, conveys more meaning perhaps than one, right? ACL one doesn't tell me anything about your list. ACL no access, oh, you're blocking something, right? No access, you're, you're, who's being blocked? So you get more meaning out of your um, list. I think there's a limit on the length of an access, well, there is a limit. I think the limit is 32 characters. So you are limited in how long these access list names can be, but you can convey a fair amount of meaning. Remember, the remark statement, whether you're using a standard or um, a standard named or a standard numbered list, you should use remark statements to add even more detail. And verify the ACL. So there's some show commands that can verify what interface and what direction the ACL is applied to. And we can also take a look at the list in the in the show run, or we can type show access list and it lists just the list, which is convenient. And we can take a look at those and make sure the statements are what we intended them to be. It will also conveniently track matches. That's how many packets match that statement. So here, as I test my list, if I were running some traffic against the list through the router and expecting it to get denied or permitted, I can use these match statements, which incrementally go up as the packets match statements in the list to verify the list is working. So that's a convenient way. And you get that only when you type show access list. So when you type show access list, you will see the matches. And you can uh, clear that with the clear access list counters and then the number of the list or the name of the list. And you can see that in the lower right where they've typed clear access list counters and then the list name or the list number, and that'll clear out all those counters. 
So that's really helpful when you're retesting. So maybe you've um, tested the list and it didn't work right and you went and made some changes and you want to retest it. You can clear those counters. Um, another way, of course, you could reboot the router. The, the counters are stored in RAM, so they wouldn't survive a router reboot, but it's much quicker and nicer, especially on production routers, just to clear the counter. Okay, let's talk for a moment about the access class command. So we use access list to make a list. We use access group to apply it to an interface. And we use access class to apply it to a VTY interface. So VTYs are not real interfaces. So when we type um, line VTY04 or whatever we type, we're going in a virtual interface. VTY means virtual the V and VTY. So we're in a virtual interface. So VTY works on any real interface, right? So your VTY is not assigned to a particular real interface. What connects to a VTY? Typically Telnet, SSH, things like that. And so we can apply an access list of those so we can um, permit only certain IP ranges from connecting to our interface. Maybe we want to limit what can connect, say from SSH, to certain IP ranges. Well, we can certainly do that. And you can see that's uh, done here. We've gone in to line VTY04 and they've typed transport input SSH to limit the connections to only SSH. And they've said IP, sorry, access class 21 in. So they're using list 21. Again, I would use a named ACL, uh, call it like SSH permitted or something, but um, they're using the number 21 and it's always going to be in the in direction. So you're always filtering in the in direction and they're permitting a certain IP range. So everything else is being denied. Now that statement deny any, you don't really need that, do you? I mean, there's an implicit deny any at the end of the list. So that's really unnecessary that they put that there. One reason you might add that statement at the end of your list is you can see how many things match it. So you can see what's being denied. Remember, if it's implicit, you don't get a counter because it never shows up. It's an invisible deny any at the end of every list. But if we wanted to actually see how many packets are getting denied, I wonder if someone's trying to break into my router. I could do an access list 21 deny any at the end of my list. And then when I do the show access list command, I would see a match counter of how many packets were matching that statement. And if it was high number, I would have an idea I was under attack, that someone had been trying to guess my password. And without this, um, without this access list, they could just do that all day. They could keep connecting and they would get a login prompt and they would try a username and try a password. And we call that a brute force attack. And they can just keep trying and keep trying. About every three tries, it resets the interface and they have to reconnect. But there's no limitation on how many times they can do that. Also, they could do that as a denial of service attack, I suppose, and they could really try to uh, tie up my VTYs. And I can block all that with an access list. So now with the access list, if they're not coming from the 192.168.10 network as their source IP, they don't even get a login prompt. They get denied. So it's very useful. And of course, if you try, in this case, we're trying from a network that is denied. Notice there's a match. So we would get a match statement or deny any. And we would also, as the connection, get refused. It would show SSH connection refused. Notice no login prompt. If we try from a device that's on a permitted network, PC1 in this case, we get the login prompt. Let's talk about troubleshooting access lists. I already mentioned you have to have at least one permit statement in an access list or all traffic is denied, right? Because there's an implicit deny any. So you can't have an access list with only deny statements. You must have at least one permit statement or nothing's permitted. And of course, placement of the ACL is important. And so really, the implicit deny any is something to keep in mind that you need to have at least one permit statement. That sometimes is the problem with why an access list doesn't work is someone is thinking about what they want to deny. And because without an access list, everything is permitted, we sometimes forget that that behavior changes when we apply an access list to an interface and that now everything is denied unless we permit it. 
the order of aces. Sometimes we forget that the list is processed sequentially from top to bottom because especially when we add to a list, we're adding statements to the bottom of the list. So we might add a permit statement that actually is denied um, before, like you can see here. So here we have denied that subnet and then permitted that host. Well, that host can't be permitted because that host is part of that subnet, so it'll get denied in the previous statement. So we need to actually reorder those statements to put the permit host above the deny subnet. That way, if the host um, packet comes along, it matches the permit statement first and is permitted, and all the other packets would, would correctly match the deny statement. But as written um, in the uh, example above, at the top of the slide, it wouldn't work. But in the revised example down at the bottom, it works correctly. I should mention that uh, Cisco IOS 15 will automagically fix simple errors like that for you. So it'll freak you out the first time. It reorders the statement in your ACLs for you. So try typing them in the wrong order like that and then type show access list and you'll see the statements have changed order. There is some logic processing now in Cisco IOS where it runs through the list and goes, that doesn't make sense, you can't do that and it will just automatically fix it for you. I found that really um, when I upgraded a router, there's a production router that I upgraded to iOS 15, and I thought someone had hacked my router for a good five or 10 minutes. I sat there and I was really distraught because all of my access lists were in slightly different orders. Maybe not all of them, but many of them. And it was because the Cisco iOS had decided that the order in which I had typed my statements was not the most efficient. So, or effective. Um, so it will actually change the order, but it doesn't catch all errors. It's like, a, it's like the um, current state of artificial intelligence and self-driving cars. It should be used with caution. So you still want to review your list manually, still want to think through the logic and the order. Don't be like, ah, I don't have to really think, the router will do that for me. That's not true. But do be prepared that a certain reordering of your statements could occur. And this is just talking about that, how it will reorder statements sometimes um, in the order it feels is the, is the most effective. All right, routing processes in ACL. So it's important to realize how a router works on an ACL in terms of when it is processed. So this tells you kind of the, the sequence that you go through. So again, if it's an ingress, it is being processed before routing. If it is an egress, it is being processed after routing. So this creates, here's a problem that might come up. You might have applied an access list to an egress interface, and now certain traffic is being blocked. It's not, it's not getting through, but it's actually not the ACL's fault. It might actually be a routing table. Maybe you're missing a route to that network, but you're blaming it on the access list. And if you know that access lists are processed after routing, you would check the routing table first because you would follow that packet as it, as it comes to be, all right, after it arrives, it has to be routed, do show IP route, take a look at the route entries and make sure that destination network is listed in the routing table because that's a prerequisite for routing, right? You have to have those destinations listed in the table. If not, it's actually a routing problem and not an access list problem. So sometimes we might blame um, the blockage of traffic on an access list when in fact, it's not the, um, not the fault. Or similarly, we might look at routing tables, try to figure out why traffic isn't getting to a destination, and it's an ingress ACL that's blocking it before it has a chance to be routed. So we go and we go, I don't get it, it's being routed. So always keep in mind that it could be an ACL that is causing your problems. In summary, you should now be able to explain how ACLs filter traffic, explain how ACLs use wildcard mass, explain how to create a standard ACL, how to place it on an interface, and configure standard ACLs to filter traffic to meet certain requirements. You should be able to use sequence numbers to edit an ACL, so make sure you try that. Configure a standard ACL to secure VTY access, so you should know how to 
create an ACL and apply it to your VTY lines. Explain how a router processes packets when the ACL is applied. Remember, it's different on an ingress from an egress. And then troubleshoot common ACL errors using CLI commands, primarily show commands. Thank you.